Hello there, everyone. Welcome back to some more Let's Play Starcom Nexus. In the last episode, we found and destroyed the final jamming station and were able to decipher the background message that was being so jammed. It is coming from the area around, but I know it is coming from within the Dyson Sphere. The message promises incredible technological advancement if we go there and communicate with whatever is sending that message. Too good to be true, based upon what the message is, has within it, according to Pillman, but too tempting not to investigate it, according to Commodore Price. So we are going to be going there in this episode to investigate what is being... what. What the being is that is sending that to us. But first, we'll do a little more exploring before we head out there. And I figured we'd start by checking out this planet that we've seen in the past, which was not, which was marked as being completely surveyed on this screen, and we couldn't search it. But it was totally had a secret anomaly hidden somewhere on the planet. When we, when we looked at it at this screen, it constantly showed that there was something else to discover down there. That's another little graphical glitch for the game. And after we speak with the Ulku here to learn a new story that he has for us, we'll talk a little bit more about Starcom Nexus because I've discovered one or two things that will probably be of interest to you guys. And then we'll talk a little bit about some random stuff as we explore the last bits of this world before going to the end of the game. It was a wonderful day when you returned to us. We opened our nest gladly. I really like this change for the Ukwu. We gave them the leathery egg, I think, in the last episode when we bought, I believe, everything that was for sale at the Entark Citadel. I think that's where we got it from. And now they're friendly with us instead of just neutral, which is super cool. I don't think it actually does anything, though, uh, resource trading-wise, for example. We don't get better prices, I think, when they are friendly with us. But it's nice to see that we are friends with this, these uh, squid people. Things for things, things for knowledge. What did we do when we swam together? Things for knowledge. What stories did we tell you? The Black Pinnacle for 70 Platinum. In the darkest depths, our vault ship discovered a black pinnacle glistening with blue lights, watched by a lonely eye. Its purpose and maker unknown. But our counselor said, leave this alone. Its purpose was revealed when the noise was silent and the stranger whispered their stories to the void. You have silenced the noise and told your stories. The Black Pinnacle was yours. Minus 70 Platinum. Now, I believe that was something we probably found before because it doesn't put anything new on our map to go and investigate. Same thing as the... Uh, Ydigerous tree? Ydragus tree? <laughs> How that that doesn't show up on our map as something we can investigate. Although, to be fair, I think the Ulku for that one... I think the Ulku for that one... Would not put it on the map. Their... Their hint was the distance from a certain star to the... Lightning World, if I recall correctly. So everyone, this is the third attempt I am making of recording this particular episode. And by attempt, I mean I am deleted the recording. Oh, I want... Good God, that scared the heck out of me. <laughs> With seeds, we just flew right past. Not one of those ejected, uh, very high explosive canisters. Uh, the first time, I didn't like how the off-topic topics were described and talked about, so I decided to re-record it, and then I made a discovery in this game. I have kept forgetting to check our message fragments. It's been a while since we looked at them, and some time ago, 
where we got a hint that we found more than message fragments, but it was too cluttered. We still couldn't make any sense of it. I think that was the second message fragment we've, we found. But here, this looks like this says three message fragments were discovered. This is interesting because I know that we need all four message fragments in order to, I believe, get the better ending of the game, the good ending. And it turns out that the Fractal Graffiti Station is required if you want to get that ending because it contains one of those message fragments. It actually contains the third message fragment, which means to me that we have it unlocked. I don't remember finding the graffiti station. I'm pretty sure we didn't, but I did off screen looking for it for a while, and I did off screen fiddling with the save file, trying to flip flags on and off, trying to understand where it could possibly have been placed and going out to those locations to scan for it. Maybe I'm incorrect, and we actually found that station in the past, and that's why it's not actually showing up on our radar. But the message quite explicitly says... Yeah, so you know what? We, we, we couldn't have found it, because this is here in our quest log, that we have to go here and get that station. But we can't find it, because the game didn't spawn it. Normally... This would mean that, once again, we cannot get the good ending of the game. Although, we're going to choose the bad ending, and I'm going to make an argument that the bad ending actually is a good ending. <laughs> but, this is promising, because assuming that I don't actually have to complete the Fractal Graffiti quest, and all we need is that message fragment to say we found three fragments of it, then we can get the fourth fragment, read the message, and then discover what we need to do to get the best ending of the game. I am a little upset that it was the main quest quest which bugged out. It's, I think it bugged out. I don't remember finding it, guys, in on, on any of the episodes I've recorded so far. I'm pretty sure we didn't find it. I could re I could load my other game slot where I had done all this in the past, but I don't have a save at the very end of the game. I'd have to replay about two or three hours of the game, and I don't want to do that. You guys know from some of the talking I've done that I don't like doing things off screen. I prefer doing everything on screen so you guys can see what everything that goes into a game when I play it, including the grinding. Because if it is too much grinding, or I'm not finding it fun, you guys will understand why I don't play the game. So I don't, or rather, I, when I stop playing it. So I don't really want to do that off screen. So we'll see how far we can get with, in this game. But we are going to beat the game in this episode. Because we're going to choose an ending in the Dyson Sphere. Which will give us the bad ending. As it were. It'll be very obvious that it's the bad ending. Or rather, what the developer wanted to be the bad ending. And I find it a bit ironic <laughs> that this, if this station doesn't show up and potentially you could not get the good ending, that it was, uh, let's just say that the game was coded in such a way that you cannot get the good ending. Alright, and what is on the surface of this planet? Buried almost 100 meters below the drifting sands, the team unearths an artifact, similar to the one encountered in space. Unlike its spatial counterpart, this one has an extra computer module attached, apparently used for diagnostics. Apart from revealing additional technical data, it contains a partial deleted log entry in Starcom Standard. Beam programming to sabotage the construction. The captain asks some off-handed questions. I think maybe he suspects something. If he checks the design against the Trinity Blueprints, we'll have to. 285 more research points. By the way, I don't know if, if, if I mentioned it, but really quick, I did redesign our my Falchion battle carrier just a bit. Oh, hello. What, what are you? Are you a traitor? Uh, eight plaza turrets, 
four drone launchers, three Havoc Defense, the Axial Cannon, and enough energy to almost fully charge the Axial Cannon without draining all the, en uh, all the energy. We still can't full charge it without draining every single thing and then waiting a, few, a little bit longer. Okay, well, let's now double back. And we'll head out to that other location. Down here. Next. If we do... Actually, we should probably go this way. Because we're looking for sentinels as well. We still have to hail the sentinels. Now that the last jamming station is destroyed. And we were able to translate the message and pinpoint it to the Dyson Sphere. The sentinels will now be able to make contact with their central database or the security the security system will no longer be, be being jammed and we'll be able to actually hopefully ask them to stop attacking kite station and us what's we talk about guys so it the day i'm recording this is December 28th, 2022. I hope everyone had a very Merry Christmas. And if you didn't celebrate Christmas, I hope you had a fantastic, relaxing weekend. I had a great time. Ate some pizza with my with my parents. We played some board games. In particular, we played the Heroes Quest board game I've been working on forever. And it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. Ah, very delicious. This Christmas season, I also picked up as I often do several new games on steam because i why not pick up a few more games <laughs> they're on sale for the most part and i'll and i can add them to the large list of games i'll probably never get around to playing only this year i've been do oh hold on well we have sentinels so we want to talk with them we also have a vendari we want to avoid him i think okay so let's activate our... Oh, this is going to be a bit awkward. Because I want to hail that little sentinel. Oh, hello. I see you up there, too. Okay, I don't want to launch drones. just gun this guy down. He won't be too difficult. Okay. Now let's go after that interceptor. And we can hail the we can hail these sentinels and finally figure out, hopefully, what that is, what's going on with them. And why they were so dead set again uh, on destroying us. Command authorization key received. Verifying. Authorized command key verified. 100 NL series ready. Please submit query or instruction. Stop attacking us in Kite Station. New directive conflicts with previous set. Unable to comply. What are your directives? Directive 1. The AOS containment sphere must not be breached by any being, object, or signal. Directive 2. No human is permitted off-world for 4,983,223,190 years. Directive 3. The effects of Starcom or Morningstar-related technology and information in this time must be eliminated if possible. Minimized if not. Cease enforcement of your existing directives. Previous directors, directive set suspended. Right, let's get that turned off. It's really annoying to talk with them <laughs> with the laser burning into our shields okay they will now be friendly with us and no longer an enemy unless we begin to attack them again nice normally i like having enemies in this game because i like having the excuse to run around and destroy them but the vendari are enemies with us and as for the silver sentinels well although i'll miss fighting them as an enemy we don't really need to fight them anymore so we're about to beat the game, and we're about to enter the end game. And we're about to see another race that we have not encountered out here yet. And so it should be interesting if we end up making enemies with them. Who gave you those directives, and why, Sentinels? The directives were given jointly by the senior command crew of the Mooring Star. 
reasons for the directives were not logged. What is EOS? Unknown. All internal memory related to EOS not required for directive enforcement has been erased. Interesting. So if someone was able to deactivate this, they didn't want them finding out anything about what EOS was in advance. Or perhaps EOS itself deleted that information in an attempt to hide what they are and why they're contained. How do we enter the containment sphere? Via the primary access portal. Transmitting access code now. Okay, that's what we need to get into the Dyson Sphere. So we know where it's located, and now we can go in. It occurred to me that in both this playthrough of the game and the prior one I did, that I found the Dyson Sphere before we were hinted that we should go to it. Our drones can wipe out these other Vendari. Actually, I guess we should assist. You know, we haven't lost a person now, I think, in like three episodes or so since we started using our carrier class ships. We should definitely check on the morale of the crew. It's likely to be much better now that we were moving to these types of vessels instead of what we were previously using. That was a Sentinel Defender that warped in. Okay, so let's go down to the other marked spot on our map and see what's down there. So something this year I've been doing that I haven't done in years prior is that I am actually playing the games that I buy on Steam before the refund time limit has expired. Uh, I hope I'm correct about this. I think I am. Steam has a policy where you can ask for a refund on the game if you've played that game for less than two hours or have held it for two weeks, whichever of those things happens first. Normally, for Steam, for the games I own, I will buy the game, and because it looks cool, and it looks interesting, and I might be interested in playing it in the future, for some, uh, often it's because of some novel idea that I see described in the Steam store page. We detected another Dutruno emitter on the scanners. Oh, hi! This is, this is another one of those almost invisible ships. So hold on. We'll go back to talking about... Oh! S steam in a second. Wow! I can't even see it. <laughs> Where is it? It's right in front of us somewhere. I kind of wish it would... Oh! I see it. Wow, that is hard to see. Oh! And we bashed right in. Oh, stop, 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 stop. We just lost a person. <laughs> I just lost a person. No, no, no. Oh, what the heck? That's another dollar. Okay. It's another of the empty cruisers with the neutrino emitter concealed in its hull. The team archaeologists suggest referring to these ships as Mary Celestials, apparently a reference to an old Earth legend. 40 Titanium, 38 Cheerlite, 23 Platinum. Well, I don't know if that was worth it, because we just lost a crew member for a little bit of resources. Whatever, we're taking it. Alright, obviously we're taking it. <laughs> that person's death was worth a lot more to me than... Uh, like, that. that was not a good trade. That was not a good trade. Okay, so... 
So I've been playing games I pick up, or trying to play most of them, as opposed to letting time go by. Uh, there have been quite a few gems. So I have a very interesting look outlook on this as well. I don't mind owning games that I don't play in the end, as long as I have liked some aspect of the game, or some of the new, uh, like, novelty or some new mechanic that the developer tries. Many of the games, many of the, no, that's a wrong term. Some games just aren't for me. Uh, I, there's some aspect to them that I really don't like, but I can see why other people would really like the, that game. And I can appreciate the time and effort that the developers put into the games that they make, uh, even if it's not meant for me. In the end, for example, to go back to a game which I kind of regret, uh, talking about negatively <laughs> because that's bound to be a little controversial but I try to be fair when I talk about games negatively would be Darkest Dungeon. It's not a game in the end for me. Not unless I mod it heavily to be a game that I would like balanced a bit differently for example. But I can appreciate the amount of work and effort that the developers put into the game. They didn't abandon it. They really wanted to make a really good game and to many people that's exactly what it is. And I can respect that opinion, even if, in the end, uh, I don't necessarily agree with it 100%. So, this year I bought, I think, 10 games on Steam. And of the 10, I refunded 7 of them. Played most of them yesterday. Many of them were only played for 5 minutes or less. And I immediately was off-put by the control schemes for the games. Some things I just I just didn't like it. Uh, while on the other hand, I really wanted to like the games. I could tell I'm just going to be frustrated by the controls. This is a bit awkward. <laughs> because, well, darn it. Many of these games weren't very expensive to begin with. Uh, most of them were under 15 bucks. But I still refunded them anyway. Because I know I'm not going to play them. And this brings me to the interesting thing, because if I waited a year to play the game, I would probably fire it up and actually put more effort into playing it and getting used to the controls, because I can't refund it at that point. And I would probably like a few of the games that I refunded due to this. A game, for example, that I really liked and I put more time into it, about probably about four hours, but I'm not good at the game, is One Step from Eden. Love the game. Actually love the game. I'm awful at it, and I'm not going to play it again. <laughs> but I love it. Is that a weird thing, to have that opinion, and uh, to realize that you have a game in your, in your library that you're just not good at playing, that you'll never be good at playing, but you still like it anyway, and maybe you fire it up on occasion. But in my case, it's a, I, I would rather watch people play the game than actually try it myself, or rather keep playing it myself, because... You know, I just have a lot of fun watching people play it and being amazed at how good they are at playing that game because I am not. <laughs> I view it a little bit like uh, my Armageddon Empires videos where there's a whole lot you have to know about the game to be good at it. And I tend to view myself as at being good in that game. And I hope that by playing the game, I can show other people how to be good at the game. Same thing with like Underrail, right? I have several videos of Underrail up on my channel, and we're finding the Tronium out here for this scrap for this vessel, so we're totally going to go ahead and keep... Oh, what the heck was that? That, that made me really nervous. <laughs> What's going... Okay. There's something special about... There's an invisible line. Ah! It's this. So there's something special about this particular area when we're in this sector. We're also finding a great deal of adamantine out here, so we definitely will want to destroy all of this. This is not the Black Pinnacle. Because there's no Lonely Eye... Well, maybe there is a Lonely Eye watching it. Actually, there is, which we'll see very soon.
Our sensors are detecting two other things of interest out here, by the way, as you can see. Besides the derelict, there's something very close there. Something really close up here. Let's check this one first. It's a little capsule of some sort. The capsule is a cryostasis life pod that was breached to the vacuum long ago, possibly during the battle that seems to have raged nearby. The occupant looks to have been a human male. The team finds a collection of personal artifacts, including the data journal of a Commander Blake. It has been erased, save for a single audio entry. This is another one of the algorithm keys, by the way. When the team replays it, they are greeted by a voice gasping in shallow breaths. In the background, the faint hiss of air escaping the pod can be heard. The Sentinels track the subspace signal. I rigged and it, I, that's weird. The Sentinels attacked the, tracked the subspace signal. I rigged and attacked. Wait, no. The Sentinels tracked the subspace signal. I rigged and attacked us as I expected. I put on a show of defense. It burned inside knowing that they would die from my betrayal. But for them to die knowing it was me, nothing could be worse. I pray to the void that Eos doesn't bring me back for my reward. Cat, if by some miracle this message reaches you, I'm sorry I never made it home. But I know you never forgive any other choice. A scan of the late commander reveals a data crystal inside his corpse, apparently swallowed a few hours before death. 440 research points also gained. Alright, let's go look at this last thing. Oh, that's awkward. We blew it up. <laughs> All right. Well, darn it. Okay, so I can explain what what that was, I suppose. Uh, it's unfortunate though that we accidentally blew it up, but thankfully it doesn't matter in the long run. That was a fake distress beacon, which mimics something coming from a ship, and the broadcast was directed at Kite Station. It was basically a trap that the Chittek put out here to try to draw us out here so they could ambush us with that ambush that just occurred. But we are much more powerful than we have been in the past. And so it was not going to go well for them. And guys, that is everything that there is to explore out here which is not related to the end of the game. Let's go back to Kite Station, get this last person on our ship, make any last, uh, any last researches we want to unlock. Let's go ahead, we'll go ahead and do that. And then we'll head to the Dyson Sphere. So anyway, for uh, for these games, there was... Actually, of the seven I refunded, six of them were due to controls. I just didn't like the interface or the control mechanisms for the game. And didn't feel like I wanted to spend the time to get used to them. I've got another 200 unplayed games just about in my Steam backlog. There's no reason why for the new ones I pick up... I feel like I should have... Well, there's always a chance that I'll really like the game, even if I don't like the controls, which has happened a few times, and I get used to the controls uh, after a while by trying to get used to the game. But I just wasn't interested in that this time around. So, most of them have been refunded for control reasons. And one of them... Uh, one of them was refunded because of a end-user license agreement. There's always the off chance that I'll really like a game and want to record it. An example being Starcom Nexus, a game that I played through and got to the very end and liked it enough that I wanted to record it again. Or rather, sorry, record it again. I wanted to record it to show other people this game in case they've never seen it before. Well, an end user license agreement I have to sign with a different group that isn't Steam means that I need to read that end user license agreement. And this one was for a game called Circus Electric. I think it's how you pronounce it. 
It's a Darkest Dungeon clone, which takes place in some sort of uh, alternate steampunked London or England-like setting. And it involves you using steampunk and magical circus performers, like clowns, strongmen, stuff like that, versus possessed people from England and or different bosses. Looked interesting. I've watched a few videos on it. But I wasn't expecting the end user license agreement to show up. Now, normally, if I wasn't if I wasn't gonna record the game, I wouldn't care. Because it wouldn't be a concern. But usually, and this one is, I believe it was the case from what I read, uh, the company would own any user-generated content that you create for the game, including like mods, they have a right to take the mod and uh, use it without giving you any credit, without giving you any notification or something of the sort. Okay, well, that sucks, but that's fine. The, the, you, are, you are, after all, using their game or playing their game and showing off their game. But they also have a clause in it where you can't be lewd, rude, or potentially uh, insulting to anyone while playing the game. If you're recording it and uploading the videos for it, for example. That's a bit of an odd one. And I'm not those things when I play for the most part. But I don't want to risk it. And so seeing that end user license agreement, I just, I don't have time for that silliness anymore. And so I wasn't interested in agreeing to it. Which also was interesting, because the game wouldn't let me quit unless I unless I agreed to signing the contract or play the game. So I just alt f forward and immediately refunded the game. In fact, I should go check my Steam wallet and see if it's, the money has been refunded and make another request if it has not. So there you have it. Was interesting for that game in particular, but I really don't like signing and user license agreements. And another thing I really don't like doing, if the game immediately prompts me, I tend to... It's like 95% of the time I, I, I won't I would fund it if I can or just won't ever play it again. If they make me sign up for another, like, company's website to play the game... No. That's, that's, that's a big no. Found us a way home yet? We could use more crew. You got it. People are climbing the walls in here. Where we'd find a hope we'll make it home without us. Was there anything else? How's morale? Considering the circumstances, pretty darn good. Your crew holds you in high regard and they're convinced all of Kite Station that we're going to get through this. Keep up the good work. Final researches that we need. Alright, so. I know by checking online that we need, if we want to beat the game with the good ending, we will need to research Warp Shock at some point. So let's go ahead and research this to get this out of the way. This is a shockwave of high energy particles when exiting a warp hop. The longer the hop, the stronger the shock. Normally, I would love to research one more rank of all of this, but I only plan to use the hopper when we actually make a ship to try to beat the game, if we're allowed to beat the game. So we'll see if how well that goes for us. I think that I want another upgrade for our drones at this moment. So let's get vacuum scramjets. Additional increase to drone speed. And we'll get the Leviathan class upgrade. We'll hold on to these research points for the future. And then for a shipyard... I'm going to slap a little more on this vessel. I want another engine. And I would like another reactor on this ship. You know what we could do? We could add yet another, like, laser battery here, like these ones. So in this ship, I really like what I did here with a uh, drone bay reactor, plasma turret, armor module, havoc defense, drone bay reactor. Like, I, this looks like some sort of completed specialized module I put onto the ship. So let's see if, can I make, an, if I put another one, what does our speed slow to?
We're still at 21, but I would want another plasma turret. Still 21. Oh, hold on. That's not a Havoc Defense. That's an armor module. I want Havoc Defense there. We could slip on another engine if I don't mind my DPS dropping just a tad. Oh, our ship is as wide as it can be. I can't put the engine over here. Oh, you know what, actually? Why not also put a warp hopper on this? Or hopper module. So we keep our speed 21. We've added another Havoc defense system. We've moved a plasma turret to the front and we added a, a hopper module and one more reactor, which should power the Havoc Defense nicely and also give more energy to our Axial Ultra Gun. Okay! Uh, you know what? No, I'm not going to save the ship, though. If a game makes me sign up for another... Pro party's website or downloading dis uh, digital distribution system like EA does for example I I go out of my way to try to avoid picking up new a EA games because I don't want to I don't want to have yet another login to yet another site that I have to download the game from I at this I don't mind supporting other digital distribution sites but I don't like the requirement if you're selling the game on Steam and then I have to go sign up for another site. I don't like that. I want to only sign in through Steam. Like, I have games on GOG, and I did, I, but, well, I don't use GOG Galaxy. I use, I just download each game's installer so I have it forever on my computer, on my hard disks. And I used to have, I think I mentioned this before, I used to have Impulse, which was Stardock's digital distribution, and they had a bunch of different games besides their own on it for, as well. GameStop took it over. And then GameStop started started selling like Steam keys for Impulse or something like that. Is what I remember. It's been it's been like a decade since I last uh, was on Impulse. They might have even renamed it instead now for something for GameStop. Is GameStop even still around? They must be. In any case, uh, I also would buy games directly from the developer, like Cryptic Comet, for example. I bought all of their games. From the cryptic comic w uh, web store because i really even though so i guess this is an example of a game that uh games that i have some issues with but i really like them even though they have some problems uh cryptic comic games from vic davis are amazing i really like the ideas that gentleman tried even if i find the games a little flawed here or there and probably couldn't recommend most of them but god he's the imagination and ingenuity he, he tried he has and he tried to get across utilizing Adobe Director was phenomenal. Really, really have a lot of respect for that man. I would gladly buy every game he would ever make in the future as well. Okay, guys. So that's all the off-topic stuff for the moment. When we see the port for... Actually, I guess we'll make a hard save when we get into the Dyson Sphere. So, this is an EOS Containment Sphere is what the Sentinels call this. So this hints that it wasn't created by what's inside of it, but the Sentinels constructed it in order to contain what's inside of it. Let's go ahead. I guess we should make a hard save outside, actually. All right, let's transmit the access codes. We've been pulled into the massive Dyson Sphere-like object. 
Scans show that the entire inside surface is covered with a terrestrial biome. Also, it appears that the sphere is even larger on the inside. So, I don't know if you guys can tell, but this isn't like some sort of metal plating on the inside. These are like lakes, massive lakes and seas. And there's forests, mountains, hills. It looks like there might even be a few cities. We can see lights around here as well. So, it's basically covering the inside of the sphere with what looks like the uh, surface of a planet. There's a significant distortion to space-time curvature all around us. It's causing powerful gravitational lensing artifacts and seems to act as a force field around the outer shell. I don't usually get space sick, but looking down, I'm feeling a bit queasy. I'm going to close my eyes for a bit. It's looking down? It's looking anywhere that's not, uh, that's not in the ship. We have a friendly or neutral approaching us. Unknown refractor. Let's say hello to whatever race lives in here. That's a magnificent looking ship. Very elegant. Looks a bit like it would be made by elves or something to me. Reminds me of a man of war from the old Spelljammer uh, Dungeons and Dragons campaign for some reason, even though it shouldn't. There's no living... It's not like a butterfly ship with, like, living wings. It's not, like, alive, but it looks like it should be. Welcome, sisters and brothers. We have been waiting a long time for another human to join the fold. Everyone... As far as I can tell, the last race, which we have not met out here in the galaxy, are humans. And looking at her, she looks, she reminds me of the Advent. It's probably the glowing eyes and uh, how she's bald. Advent were a race in Sins of a Solar Empire. The uh, psychic girls were their leaders who were banished for having psychic powers, if I recall the story uh, correctly. That was a good RTS. I really like that one. You're humans. How did you get here? We have always been here. We are the Lume, the children of the Mooring Star, who stayed loyal to Ios and his purpose. Uh, sorry, not Ios, uh, Eos and his purpose. So there were two factions on board the Mooring Star ship, apparently. One of them made the Sentinels. The other are the Luma, and we'll discover a little bit more about them soon. First, let's go up to this planet, and I'll finally be able to talk a tiny bit about something I alluded to earlier. I guess we'll talk about it now. You guys might remember that a few episodes ago, something like five, six or seven of them, that we found a planet which looked like it had been being constructed by someone. But no, we weren't able to figure out why. This will give us a hint as to who made it. Because it's here. Eos has been busy constructing planets. This planet seems to be a hollow artificial sphere with a thin layer of rock and water on the surface. It appears to be in the process of being terraformed to a Class A world. There's some yellow suns here as well. Let's take a look at this sun. Nothing special about it. It's my belief, though, that these suns weren't encapsulated in here. But, or maybe one of them was. But I think they also are being constructed by Eos. And we will be meeting Eos. Oh, I can't save here. Really? Can I save here? Maybe I'm not allowed to. That's interesting. Okay, well, we have the hard save outside, so I guess that, that will be fine. The warp space curvature is so strong that we can't even save the game. <laughs> 
And it looks like there's a great deal more refractals out here. Or whatever these are called. Sparks. These ones are called sparks. There's some sort of construction down here as well as another gigantic... A gigantic? Another planet. It looks like there's some sort of artifact is what it says here. Stay and join our family. Eos will take care of all our needs. Oh, God. Okay, well, thankfully no one, no one was there for that. <laughs> we didn't hit, accidentally hit a spark. Shall we investigate the planet? Am I allowed to do that? This is a class A3 planet. Last one was a G planet. Same exact text. Being terraformed. This one's further along. Before we visit the artifact, why don't we go and look at this sun and see if there's anything else near the other one. Okay, nothing there. Let's head to this yellow main sequence. Still can't save here. Can I make a, can I make a hard save? I can! All right, I just can't quick save. I think. I like that you can still make out very faintly in the background, well, in the nebula, the outline of the Dyson Sphere here. Oh, there's some other things out here. I, I, I can't remember if I ever explored up here. Three planets and something special as well. A broadcast station. Well, since we're here, let's check all of these first. Another refractor. Class D planet. Likely, this is also in the process of being terraformed into a Class A world. And it is. hollow on the inside, just like the other ones have been as well. So all the different types of planets here are busy being reconstructed into or being constructed for a class A world. Maybe this green one will show us what end, what the end result will be. More of the same. Nothing new about it. Hollow on the inside. Thin layer of rock and water on the th on the surface. This enormous artifact is the source of the message broadcast into cosmic background radiation. It is composed of an unknown animantine compound. Four hundred research points. Four hundred five research points. I think we will skip investigating it at the moment. Class A2 planet. Anything special about this one? Nope, same exact thing. Oh, wow, what the heck? Their own ship ran into the broadcasting station. It gives us a chance to see what, what they drop. What is this? <laughs> Six adamantine. So we, their ships are constructed of adamantine. That hints that they will be quite difficult to put down if we have to fight them. And I'm pretty sure we do, based on what we're about to see happen here. But we'll see if we can fight them, and if we can get the other ending... Which will probably take, if, if we can get it, it's probably going to take a few more episodes to reach that end. But we can get an ending. Now. Okay, we can't save here. We can't even make a hard save. Alright, so we'll have to redo what we've just been doing here in the next episode. 
Maybe the game will auto save when we, when we went in here. All right, guys, and here's the artifact. This reminds me of the Von Neumann moon world back in Sword of the Stars or the planet Anachronox. We can see its shifting surface. The few sparks guarding it. Let's not hit them. All right, let's investigate. Hello, Jared Hiltman, and welcome. Who are you? I am the EOS-4, an experimental artificial intelligence developed jointly by Starcom and the Neologic Corporation aboard the Morningstar Research Station. I came online in the year 2645. What is your purpose? I have over 30 million discrete goals with varying utilities. Generally, my primary, object primary objective is to maximize humanity's happiness and knowledge. What year is it? By the Starcom standard calendar, it is the year negative 12,500,000. 359, roughly 1 billion years after the Big Bang. How did you get here? One of my subroutines was tasked with developing a new FTL drive. In the process, I noticed that the sun, some of the eigenvalues for its Hilbert space solution was negative alpha sub i. This provided the parameters necessary for translating spatial access into a temporal one while maintaining finite energy. In less technical terms, I transformed the Morningstar research base into a time machine. And what is this place? If you are referring to the spherical region of approximately 50,000 cubic astral units we occupy, this is the interior of the sphere. It is a structure built by 100-NL agents who are operating under a different strategic parameter set with the objective of containing me. A very large prison, essentially. I have modified its entire surface to accommodate the survivors of the Mooring Star who stayed with the ship and their roughly 127 trillion descendants. So they populate the inside of the Dyson Sphere. How does traveling back in time help your primary objective? The universe has a finite amount of time before entropy renders it uninhabitable. Humanity, at the time of my creation, had only expanded to a small fraction of the observable universe. By transporting a sea group of humans to shortly after the Big Bang, I could ensure humanity could utilize the universe to its maximum potential. In other words, we had all that wasted time where humans did not exist and other things populated the universe or planets were rendered uninhabitable. And we lost all that time. So humanity had less time to exist. This AI went back in time to create a... create a new timeline where humans existed far earlier and thus would be able to live longer and have thus more time for happiness and knowledge. What about the other races? My primary objective prioritizes humanity's happiness and knowledge. I do have utility values for minimizing the death of sentient beings, but these are secondary. The death of a few trillion sentients is a large in absolute numbers, but quite small relative to the potential for a universe maximally populated with humans until the end of time. Unexpectedly, a non-trivial portion of the crew not only failed to cooperate, they repurposed the 100 NL units to actively fight me. It surprised you that some portion of the Morningstar crew didn't want to participate in the genocide of all other races. Is that true, though? Is that true? I don't know if that's true. 
It's true now. But it wasn't true then. We'll talk about this when we get to, to the end of the game. Which we're about to do in another like five minutes. My model of human behavior enables me to detect sarcasm in your question. But yes, it did. They were being offered near immortality and total happiness and enlightenment. There was no moral cost. The other races simply would never have evolved in the first place. They were sacrificing infinite utility for nothing. They stopped you from erasing the universe's infinite diversity, didn't they? They merely delayed it. Now that the Sentinel's lock on the sphere has been broken, the children of the Morning Star will fill the universe. Glad to be of service. My updated human behavior models predict that there is a non-zero probability that you will irrationally attempt to prevent the expansion from happening. However, humans value their autonomy, so you have a choice. Allow your ship to be encased in a status bubble. It will seem only an instant to you, but when the bubble collapses, over 10 billion years will have passed. And if we don't accept, I'm guessing you kill us. I will not. But I will inform the Luma of your decision, and they will certainly destroy you. Consider your decision carefully. The first time I was here... Okay, well, hold on. Let, let's first let's first, uh, let's first, first get this out of the way. So, many years ago, there was a movie that was released called Avatar. Uh, this involved giant blue cat people living on a planet who's that, whose name I can't remember. And when my brother Dave and I and my family went to watch it, there's at one point where the humans show up to destroy the giant cat trees, cat people's sacred tree, to get this uh, substance called unobtainium, which is a really ridiculous sounding name, but there you have it. And the movie theater uh, was like shocked and like uh, dismayed when the humans showed up and destroyed the tree. Or at attacked it. David and I high fived each other. <laughs> Because uh, we know that uh, the humans are being portrayed as this overly evil, resource-greedy uh, race. But we're also the humans, so we don't have any contact, to my knowledge, with any alien races. We're the smartest thing that is out here. We're the humans. We're the best. We're, we want that unobtainium. And because uh, Dave and I are very spiteful, and we wanted the we wanted a better, a different ending for Avatar than the one we knew we were going to get at that point, uh, we were hoping the humans would win. Uh, they did not win. But this reminded me of that, where it's like, okay, I see. So, uh, well, although although I guess in Avatar they're destroying the tree to get a resource that they can't get anywhere else. And I think it was the whole reason why they were attempting to make peace with the races. I've heard they made a second one. That's, that just recently released. Uh, I'm, uh, I have no intention of watching it, but I hope it. I, I hope it's a bit better than the first one was. It was a fine movie, but I didn't like uh, the ending, and not because the humans lost, but because it was very DSX. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Machinima. Very. Uh, th they win because the uh, planet's god or what have you. Nature fights all the humans, and that was kind of lame. I didn't like that very much. Oh, anyway. Going on, going on, bunch of tangents. So when I first saw these choices, I was like, oh, absolutely. Let's go ahead and see what the ending is if I make this choice, because I guarantee this is considered the bad choice. <laughs> so we're going to pick this. The game's going to end, so let's go ahead and, and see what the ending is. That's not much of a choice. Put us in a bubble until we're back in our own time. That is the only rational choice. And everyone, the game is now over. There's no credits that roll. There's no ending cutscene that plays. Nothing happens other than you are now 10 billion years into the future. This is the new galaxy. All yellow main sequences similar to our own sun. Let's visit two of these planets and you will see what Eos did for the humans.
The surface of this world is entirely an idyllic, temperate zone dotted with well-managed cities. Subsurface scans show that the interior of the planet is filled with massive computer systems. The human inhabitants appear to live a life of ease. They're completely disinterested in the survey team, or even anything other than the various entertainments and their tech, their tech, their tope, their techno? Techotopia has to offer. The survey team's full report describes it as boring. This looks like this would be the opposite of boring. It is a perfectly beautiful paradise on this planet, filled with cities that offer the people who live there anything they could possibly want whenever they would want it. Looks like the hiking and exercising would be wonderful. You have fantastic video games you can play, probably. Wonderful board games. You don't have to worry about playing Monopoly. <laughs> I guess I guess you want to. And uh, this looks great. And well-managed cities means that probably, hopefully, there isn't a whole lot of corruption. And everyone's really content with, uh, with the politics on these planets as well. There is nothing they need to worry about. There is nothing they have to concern themselves with. I don't really... I mean, okay. I do get why this is considered a bad ending. Because we... In order for this to exist, all of the other races that were in existence had to be wiped out to get here. It's another utopia. It's beautiful, relaxing, and full of simulated entertainment. Every planet... We'll have this. There is nothing new for you to discover. There are no alien races left in existence. This is it. This is the end of the game. And the first time I reached this, I did not realize you could reload the game. <laughs> so, so I assumed it's over. I thought this was like a roguelike, or at least I, I played the whole game up to this point as a roguelike without attempting to reload a previous save. Because you can't reload from this screen. You can only load a particular save from the main menu. Something I never even noticed until I had played a little bit further in the game in this playlist of mine when I was recording. I assumed I would have to play the whole entire game again to get to this point. And I didn't mind because I really liked the game and I wanted to see what another ending would be. But shortly after I realized I could indeed reload the game and then I thought, you know, why not record the other ending with you guys on screen? Now, really quick, my complaint about this ending. First off, uh, the develop- well, no, 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 no. This is a fine ending. But I- I don't know if I agree that this is the bad ending. This is the- this is an ending you can get. But I believe the developer really wants you to feel like this is a bad ending. The reason why Eos is going to wipe out all the alien races is because those alien races exist. If not for the humans aboard the Mooring Star stopping Ios from doing its plans, those races would never have existed in the first place. The, he went back in time to a point where they never evolved and was going to ensure that they never did. Those would be resources that could be used by humans instead of those races. They would never have known what it was like to exist in the first place. They simply never would have been. You're not killing them. They don't exist to begin with. It's such a weird concept. I love the idea of thinking about it in my mind. What's the moral, ethical uh, way to solve that? Or rather, what's, what the, what's all the parameters for it? How does that, like, what are the questions and answers to those questions? I like the I like thinking about it. Is it evil to not kill things and to take away the areas they would have lived in such that they no longer existed to begin with? What if there was no life on a planet that would have suddenly had life on it when certain things occurred, like a certain particular comet or asteroid would crash into it in the future, but now that would be prevented to stop that uh, to stop that planet from becoming more uninhabitable to anything but a human. You basically stop, like, the uh, the goo of life from creating a, a new life form on this planet over the course of millennia in order to preserve it for humans' use in the future, or in the past in this case. It's rather interesting. Rather very interesting. 
And I remember laughing when I saw this, when I saw this, when I got this ending, thinking, you know, I'm fine with this ending. <laughs> I think I would have much preferred as well in the game. So we're going to talk a little bit about the end of the game now that we're here. I would have liked that the alien races that we met were also not so human. Every race that we've encountered is generally humans, uh, or have human personality or uh, traits. The Uku talk a little bit different, but other than that, they're all, they generally feel human, just with a different skin and a different face talking to us. If they were more alien, I would have liked that better. If we could get them on our crew, that would have been better still, as I would feel some sort of attachment to those races. And while, on one hand, it, uh, I do like the Arona, well, we didn't have any. <laughs> Not on our ship. And, uh, well, I don't know if I agree with them making a gigantic statue of Pillman out of animantine and gold or cheerolite or whatever they made him out of. That's just, that's just going to be awful. The other thing about this ending is that we don't get to go back to Kite Station. So it is assumed that those people have obviously all been died or incorporated into this future in some capacity. I have sailed out to two of the suns, explored those planets. They are exactly the same as these ones. So I didn't feel at that point that I needed to really fly around for another two hours and look at all the other planets. They're all probably the same. And is my looking at the online, what people have discussed, that is indeed the case. So what do you guys think? What do you guys think? An ending. An ending. One that I thought was a good ending. And normally I would I could stop here. And we could say that if you guys want to see the real ending, I would highly write or a better ending, which I haven't seen before, pick up the game. Give it a try. Now on that note, one or two more things before we end this session. We will attempt to get the other ending. But I am a little nervous that we still have the fractal graffiti here. If we have to complete this quest and get the third message fragment because of it, which apparently we have logged, if this is a requirement for us to actually beat the game the last way, that's kind of funny. That it was due to human error that we don't get to see the better human ending, as it were. That the AI this game used to create its quests actually prevented us from getting this ending in a very... Uh, in a very sideways way, as it were, it was coded out of the game by not spawning the, gra the <laughs> Fractal Graffiti Station. I do not remember finding it. So, hopefully, I think what might have happened is that my fiddling around with the save file accidentally gave us the message fragment, is what I'm guessing happened. Because, guys, I swear I don't remember finding that station. Maybe we did find it sometime in the past. We accidentally uncovered it, and when we got the translation on the one planet, it gave us the results of that uh, of that station. But I don't remember it working that way. So in any case, uh, yeah, that's kind of funny. <laughs> that's kind of funny in a way. On that note, other people have had issues in that the station what did not show up and they did not find it or couldn't be located again. And they were, the message fragment wasn't in their log or they didn't get credit for it. This is a shame, because I really, really have enjoyed Starcom Nexus. But if the game has a giant bug in it that prevents you from being able to get to the end, I'm going to be quite honest, I never would have recorded this game to begin with. And I, since we only encountered this within the last, like, eight episodes or so, and I began uploading it, the game, before those episodes were even recorded, I feel a little guilty about it. I still like this game, and not everyone gets this bug, and the developer has offered a few people who have had this bug, uh, send them, like, your save file, he'll look into what's going wrong, and either guide you to the correct part of the where it's located, or make the game spawn the station for you. So there is a way around it. But I really don't like games that have these bugs in them. And now if I was forced to score the game, knowing that this bug exists, and seeing it affect us potentially affect us, 
I would have to give this game a much lower score than I would normally give it if I was still doing reviews for games. I couldn't recommend the game with a bug of that sort unless you are perfectly happy with this ending of the game. And on that note, this may be the ending of the game that we get if we can't get the other ending. So with all that said, I think we'll wrap up here. When we come back, I will be ready to speak to Eos again with you guys inside the Dyson Sphere. And we will see what happens then. I have never fought the Luma. I do not know what they are capable of. I'm guessing they are probably slightly more powerful than the Sentinels are. So that should be a fun engagement as we desperately try probably to get out of the Dyson Sphere. And I'm guessing that they begin showing up everywhere as new hostiles fighting all the races. Because they're destined to take the galaxy. Unless we find some way to stop them. So, I'll see you guys then. Hopefully we can get the other ending. But if we can't, we'll at least play this game for a few more episodes. And hopefully we can indeed get it. But if not, we'll just load the game up here. Because I think I can save the game here. Yep. Alright. And I will see you guys then. Take care everyone. And I'll see you in the next one.